I'm here today to talk about three things. Um, and they're related to each other, uh, but we're not really going to follow the title of the talk. Uh, so we're going to talk about observability. Um, we're going to talk about performance analysis a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk about this weird three letters tool called BPF. Um, and I'm going to start by um, defining a few things, um, and then we'll go from there. Um, and as I said, at, at some point, uh, we'll jump to the terminal um, and run some commands, and I'll try to explain you uh, what all this means. Um, so let's start uh, with observability. Uh, this is a term that has been around for, for a few years, and uh, uh, people define it in, in a very different ways. Um, uh, and it's a very broad topic, but today I'm not going to focus on what observability means as a whole, but I'm only going to focus on one part of uh, what observability means. Um, uh, and uh, Charity Mayors uh, published this uh, very good with blog post a, a few years ago about observability. And, and in, in this blog post, she said, um, observability is about asking arbitrary questions and exploring where the good crumbs take you. Right. So in, um, in the context of this talk, um, we're going to ask arbitrary questions uh, to the uh, Linux kernel. Um, and we're going to see where the good crumbs take us. Um, um, we're going to see that uh, actually asking questions to the Linux kernel uh, give us uh, much, mo much more insights and many more cookie crumbs than other tools could give us. Just but uh, 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 if we ask the same the same questions. Um, Observability is also about building robustness against negative events. Um, this is what people call uh, uh, black swan events. Uh, and in just usually events that are completely unexpected, um, they happen kind of a randomly, uh, but they have catastrophic results um, that could have been avoided um, if we had thought about them just for a little bit. Um, and as an example of this, I always like to talk about um, when Amazon S3 had a big outage uh, in 2016, uh, it took down half of the internet. Uh, and uh, people have, uh, have grown used to use S3, and, and they have grown used to their, their um, scalability and their, their availability so much that they don't really think that it's just another system, and it can go down at some point, right? Uh, uh, and after that, that event, we've started to see many people uh, deploying um, uh, fallback, fallbacks to other clouds, doing multi-cloud storage. Uh, there, there are a lot of projects to do um, uh, storage on containers and so on, uh, just because people are already aware that all these problems actually exist, and they can happen. Um, and if S3 goes down, you might want to do something else to, pre to prevent that your whole application all, uh, goes down and all your customers actually are affected. Um, so um, if we actually have more data and better data, uh, we could actually pre prevent those, uh, these kind of problems. Um, and, and at the end, uh, observability uh, relies on accessing the raw data from, for any kind of system. Um, um, and it, you usually see that uh, people talk about the three pillars of observability when they, when they talk about logging and tracing and metrics. Uh, but all those are derivatives from raw data. Um, so uh, if, we have a, if we can have a tool 
that give us access to much more raw data than we usually have, um, it's worth considering it and it's worth actually um, uh, using it. Um, so what is, what's this BPF thing? Um, it stands for uh, Berkeley Package Filter. Um, actually, I recently read the paper that, uh, uh, that the original authors wrote, uh, I think it was in 1993, and the title actually says B BSD Package Filter. So I don't know at which point they replaced BSD with Berkeley, but right now it stands for Ber Berkeley Package Filter. Um, it's not a package filter, <laughs> actually. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, some people call it uh, superpowers uh, in the link, in the Linux kernel. It's a very good definition uh, because it allows you to do things uh, in the Linux kernel that were not possible before. Um, um, and it, what it really is is a virtual machine that allows you to run programs in a safely manner in, inside the Linux kernel. Um, and it, this virtual machine is, in some sense, very similar to the Java virtual machine or any other virtual machine for a programming language where you actually write code, you compile it, um, and this virtual machine allows you to run it. The big difference is that instead of running it um, in an unprivileged uh, place where you, you have access to only to a few resources, you're running the code directly in the Linux kernel um, in a secure way, giving you access to every single thing that the Linux kernel knows about your system, uh, which is much more information than what you can get like if you run a, any profiler or any other tool um, uh, in, in your uh, user space outside the Linux kernel. Um, and this graph is a very, uh, how would I say, it's a very broad definition of how BPF works, but I'm gonna try to explain it. Um, we start by writing code uh, and creating a BPF program, and that happens in user space. So that happens in your terminal, that happens in your code editor, just like you go to your laptop and write the code, right? Um, the first step to actually running the code um, is compiling in the code. Like you can use LLVM to compile the code. Um, usually, uh, uh, people write this code, these programs in C, but as we'll see later, it's not the only option. Uh, so you compile your code, and then uh, you tell the Linux kernel that you have this piece of code that you can actually you want to run in the kernel. And the kernel, the first thing that it does is that like it has a verifier um, that takes that code, uh, runs it in a secure way without actually running it. It's like a kind of a dry run to ensure different things. Uh, the verifier ensures that your program is not gonna crash. Uh, so running a BPF program in the kernel is ensure that um, it's not gonna crash your computer. Um, it, it ensures that you're not gonna Act, try to access memory that you, you cannot access. So um, it's secure in a way where uh, you're, gonna, you're not gonna try to access memory that's empty um, and so on. So uh, again, just to protect your system from crashing. Um, and it's also, uh, it also ver verifies that your program is always gonna terminate. So for example, you could not write an infinite loop into a VPF program and just try to run in the kernel and see what happens. Right? Um, so their developers have spent a lot of time in making sure that whatever you want to write in, the, in this BPF program uh, is actually going to be safe. Uh, the verifier is also very nitpicky. Uh, uh, people actually struggle a lot uh, to write correct programs when they are kind of complicated uh, because, because of these restrictions. Uh, but it allows you, it helps you all the way to actually write the program in a way where it actually is going to work. Right? So when the verifier actually 
says that it's okay, that you can load your program into the kernel. Um, your program just resides in the kernel waiting for events. Um, and uh, when you write the program, uh, you specify which events you want to listen to. Um, and it, there are many different events that you can listen to, and you, we'll see a few examples in a few minutes. Uh, but basically, it's like you can attach your BPF program to anything that happens inside the Linux kernel, uh, which gives you access to like all the data in the Linux kernel. And then the final part is uh, what's called BPF maps. And BPF maps allow you to share uh, information between the kernel and the user space a program that's running. So once you, you have loaded the BPF program in the kernel, you can say, oh, I just received this event. I want to send it to user space for processing or for storage or for whatever. Um, and we'll see some examples too. Uh, but that way, you can actually collect all that raw data um, and ask the questions that you have later later on. You don't have to ask, ask all the questions uh, at the time. You can also collect the data and ask questions later. Uh, but as, as we'll see, it's actually very more useful when you can uh, ask questions on the fly. And that, that's pretty much how BPF program works. Obviously, there are many more details uh, that I'm not going to go into today uh, because instead of a 30 minute talk, this could be a, a three day talk. Uh, but this is, this is the essence of how BPF works. Um, and unfortunately, I, I made a decision with this talk is that uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to teach you to write C code. Uh, most of the more uh, interesting and more complex programs uh, require you to write C. Um, but today, after a few years of, of development in this project, you don't actually need to write C to start using BPF. And I think uh, from a starting point, it's more, much more useful for you to actually see how you can actually take that information from the Linux kernel um, and start answering those questions that you might have uh, when you deal with your, with your systems. Um, to do that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you some examples with this tool called BPF Trace. Um, BPF Trace is, um, a, a, is a command line application that you can, uh, that you can use to inject BPF programs into the kernel, and it gives you some kind of very specific DSL for you to write BPF programs without having to know C, or without having to know all the APIs that the kernel exposes uh, to actually extract the data and whatnot. Um, and this is the first example that we're gonna see. And we'll, I'll run it in, in, in my computer later so, so you'll see what happens. Uh, but I, I'm going to go through this example and I'm going to try to explain you what this, all this uh, nonsense means. Um, the first part um, is trace point, um, and that's a kernel hook. Um, in this case, this is a static uh, hook, which means that the kernel developers have annotated the code inside the kernel in a way that you can actually hook code into it. Um, there are other kinds of uh, hooks. There are also dynamic uh, hooks where you can actually attach your uh, programs and, and functions to any single line of code in the Linux, in the Linux kernel. Uh, but trace points are considered more stable uh, and don't change the, that often. So like, it's usually recommended to use trace points uh, for that reason. Then uh, the second uh, string after the colon is the subsystem. And in this, in this case, we're going to focus on syscalls. And syscalls are, is the subsystem that allows programs in user space to communicate to the kernel. For example, uh, when you go to open a file in your computer, um, the program that, that's opening the file sends a syscall uh, to the kernel to actually open in the file, right? And the kernel will go to the disk and fetch the file and so on, and it will return the the buffer to your program, and you'll see the file. Um, so those are some examples of syscalls. Um, 
and the third uh, string is the event that I want to monitor. Uh, in this case, um, enter xxv means that every time I execute a command or the, can, the kernel receives uh, an instruction to execute a command, um, I want to uh, I want to execute my BPF program. And a command could be any kind of command. It could be in your terminal like uh, ls or echo or whatever kind of command or even opening up an application will trigger a command in your in in the Linux kernel. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to I'm going to hook this program into the events that are triggered in the kernel when my system executes a command. Um, and the program is what's inside the brackets. Um, this is a, a join is a built-in function for VPF trace, which basically takes the list of arguments for the program and it's going to print it. This is a very simple VPF program. This is when the kernel receives an instruction to execute something, we're just going to print uh, what we're trying to execute. So. Let's jump into this. Oops. I have uh, my commands here. All right. Um, so uh, I've copied the same, same command that I had in the slide here. And as you can see, it's just like a string of test text. So it's BPF trace dash E for execute um, and execute this command. Um, uh, so as you can see, uh, I'm executing this command and <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of things in my system. There's a lot of things happening right now because I have uh, Zoom running, I have uh, um, Ivar, which is my uh, is, is this widget here for Zoom. There's a lot of things running. PS E. I don't even know why that is running, but it's running. Um, so, for example, if I go here and I, I run LS, I can see uh, a lot of things going on, right? So, uh, this is when I run LS, where you can see that it's like my system is just like executing a lot of things for no reason. Um, and I actually, I didn't even know about it, right? Like, so BPF uh, gives you access to all this information <laughs> in a very reliable way. Um, uh, and like, it shows you things that you might not even think about, right? Um, I can tell you, for example, here, um, all these git commands were executed because my terminal tries to find uh, a git repository for the directory that the terminal is in. So if I, if I want to jump to, for example, um, uh, this, so it's going to show the master branch in, the, in my terminal, right? So like it actually, uh, my terminal requires to run all these git commands to actually show their master, right? But you don't think, about these things that happen in your system all day, right? But they are there. All right. Um, so uh, after that uh, uh, quick example, let's talk about uh, performance analysis a little bit. And I'm, uh, when I talk about performance analysis, I always focus um, in the same thing. Uh, uh, for me, performance analysis means that um, I want to take an application uh, and I want to know uh, the parts of this application that are fast and the parts that are, that are slow and, and why that happens, right? Um, so uh, what we're going to try to do today with BPF is that uh, we're going to uh, do performance analysis on a very specific application that you'll probably know about um, 
and we're going to try to solve a questions that I have, a few questions that I have. Um, to, to solve those questions, uh, we're going to use something called frame graphs. Uh, frame graphs are a very good visualization uh, for a performance analysis because they allow you to see um, how long something requires to run uh, in your application, and it gives you access to all the stack traces in your application with, when it's running. So you can see that a specific line of code uh, might take longer or shorter, uh, and you can, you can trace back to where that application is actually taking longer. Right? Um, and we'll see some examples of flame graphs. Um, we're going to focus uh, first on on CPU flame graphs. There are many types of flame graphs. Uh, but when you want to do performance analysis, you're mostly focused on, on CPU, which means that uh, you're going to time uh, how long it takes for your CPU to do something. Uh, uh, we're going to use another tool that uh, uses VCC under the hood. In this case, is uh, VCC, uh, sorry, BPF under the hood. In this case, is VCC. Uh, this is a toolkit that allows you to write BPF uh, programs uh, using Python or Lua. Uh, uh, and it also gives you access to some C bindings that allow you to write BPF programs in a ni more nicer way. Um, we're going to use this uh, profile program to get the stack traces for a specific program. Uh, and what profile is going to do it's going to uh, load a BPF program in the kernel, uh, and the program is going to collect stack traces uh, for for a specific. Uh, the BPF program is going to collect stack traces for a specific uh, process that we're going to monitor. Uh, and uh, when I when we, when we terminate the profile program, then we'll aggregate the stack traces and see what happens. Um, we're going to sample a. a a specific frequency. Uh, BPF allows you to sample things in different frequencies for CPUs. Um, and finally, we're gonna uh, we're just gonna follow our traces to uh, to make it nicer for for flame graphs to actually display. So uh, first, uh, I have here the same command that I just showed on the slide. Um, there is this very small variation here. Um, I'm not adding the uh, uh, dash uh, lower f at the end, because I just want to print the, the stack traces so you can see all the traces that uh, this program is collecting from the Linux kernel. Um, And uh, here with pgrep, uh, something that before I forget to mention it, what we're going to do with pgrep is uh, we're going to get the PID for the Docker daemon that's running on my, on my computer. So in this case, what we're going to profile is a command that uh, I'm going to execute. Uh, I'm going to try to download a Docker image from the internet, and we're going to profile uh, the process of downloading uh, a Docker image over this internet here. Um, so now it's sampling. It's just um, waiting until Docker runs, and it's just collecting information from the kernel about uh, this Docker D process. So if I do, for example, Golang. Um, so now this is downloading uh, different layers for Docker. Um, uh, uh, we might leave it term. Let's wait until fin it finishes. It's gonna kill us, but let's let's let it finish. And now, okay. Now, now that Docker completes, I can kill my profile. And as you can see, um, well, we're seeing here some stack traces. Um, and it's, it's giving us the Docker D and the PID for Docker. And, and we can see here information about 
um, uh, Docker source code. Uh, in this case, um, this tire split, split library is the library that's um, unpacking the uh, layers and putting them on disk. So we can see that that's happening. Um, and we can also have access uh, to, to the Linux kernel directly. So uh, here, if we keep scrolling up, we can see BFS write. This is uh, the Linux kernel writing in the, into the file system. Uh, so um, we could generate this, uh, these stack traces with, with different profilers that don't use BPF, but uh, they would not allow us to see all these operations that actually happen uh, inside the, uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, and we can keep on scrolling. Um, uh, but this is not a really good way to actually visualize this. Um, so uh, I'm going to run the command again with dash f. Actually, I think I have it here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to run the same command again, uh, and I'm going to dump, dump this stack traces on a file, and then we'll transfer that, that file into um, a flame graph. So we can actually see the, the graph. Um, so I'm going to run this. I'm going to download different. Um, let's download Python. Um, now we, we can see that it's downloading the less layers because a few of the base layers are common between all the programming languages that Docker provides. So it doesn't need to download uh, all the layers again. So this is going to be faster. Um, and now it's extracting the only layer that's that's pending, right? All right, so we can stop the profiler, and now if, if we go here, um, we see the same stack traces, but they're just like a blob of text that no one understands. Um, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use this uh, flame graph uh, command to take those stack traces and create this visual representation for us to actually be able to, to debug our program. Uh, and then I'm just going to open it on Firefox. Uh, so th this is what the flame graph looks like. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of things there. Um, so uh, uh, one of the nice things about flame graphs is that you can actually, they are actually interactive. So you can click on them and you can browse through the stack traces. Um, and you can see here, let me make this a little bit bigger so you can actually read it. Um, you can see, for example, here, uh, this Docker distribution is the code that, that's downloading uh, the layers from the internet and whatnot. Um, Um, that was actually, uh, if we go here, for example, we can see that um, tar split library that we saw earlier. Um, so uh, what this means is that like, uh, this library is doing a lot of work. Uh, and most of the work is actually um, copying the bytes that are uh, coming from one of side of the pipe to another. So it's basically, uh, and turning the file into the into our file system, and that's where most of the work is happening here. Um, uh, but if you if we look at the flame graph um, as a whole, um, it doesn't look like uh, it's really doing a lot of work here. Uh, but it actually took quite a while, uh, and. Um, Something that flame graphs uh, on CPU flame graphs don't tell us is uh, that uh, there are operations that happen in the kernel um, that we're not going to see because flame graphs only uh, on CPU flame graphs only show you things that where your application is running, but uh, they're not going to show you when your application is waiting for the kernel to do something uh, like. Um, the kernel is just opening a, a pipe to the internet uh, and waiting for to receive bytes from from the Docker Hub. Um, on CPU frameworks, I'm not going to tell you that. Um, um, 
And for, for that reason, uh, there are, uh, the counterpart of on-CPU flame graphs are off-CPU flame graphs. Um, and off-CPU flame graphs are gonna tell you what happens when your application um, sends a signal to the kernel um, uh, and when the, it receives the signal back. So off-CPU flame graphs are gonna measure all that time where your application is actually waiting for the kernel to, to give you information. Um, um, and there is another similar command to profile called off CPU time, um, and it's gonna measure the, uh, exactly that, uh, how much time your program is waiting for uh, the Linux kernel to do something. Um, and and it, it has a similar uh, flags where you, you set your, the PID of the uh, process that you wanna monitor um, and then you fold the traces to generate also flame graphs, but in this case only for of uh, things that happen while your program is running, uh, is waiting. Um, so we're gonna see the... Um, actually, I'm gonna jump into this. Um, we're gonna execute the off CPU time. And again, we're gonna download an image from, oh, let's say Java. We're gonna download the, a new image from, from the Docker Hub. Um, and now we're gonna just, we're gonna see how long uh, uh, the Docker daemon is waiting for the kernel to do something. Right? That's, that's the objective of the of CPU time flame graphs. So now the Docker is done. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're gonna use the same flame graph command uh, to generate a flame graph for off CPU time. So the time that your application has been waiting for the kernel to do something. Um, uh, and it's, it, it's like, they're very similar, very, very di completely different graphs. Uh, but in this case, uh, you can see that all this information um, is uh, actually stacks from the Linux kernel. Uh, so what we're seeing here is like um, your application or Docker in this case actually waiting for mutexes in the kernel, uh, which is uh, actually, well, I would say surprising, but it's not surprising. <laughs> uh, so Docker is actually highly concurrent, so like it has a lot of mutexes to, to ensure that the layers actually uh, download correctly and so on. So like, uh, it, it's actually, uh, it makes sense that Docker is actually waiting a lot of, for like other Go routines to actually process things. Um, and then we can, we can go in here um, and uh, for example, uh, uh, we can see that this uh, distribution command uh, was just downloading uh, it's make download function and then download. This is the function that actually downloads uh, the layers from Docker Hub. Um, and most of the time, it's just like waiting for the kernel to uh, to read. Right? Um, so um, at the end of the day, the only way to actually measure total timing in an application is by combining on CPU uh, graphs and off CPU graph, otherwise you're always gonna miss uh, one side of the story, right? Um, and BPF, uh, these tools that I'm showing you actually allow you to, to see all this in a, in a very straightforward way uh, that you could not do with uh, other profilers and so on. Um, so as a conclusion, um, don't be afraid to push boundaries to find their answers. Um, BPF is actually kind of daunting technology because it was born on the Linux kernel. Um, it requires you to write C code when you want to do very complex things. But there are tools on top of BPF that give you a lot of power that you can use tomorrow in your day-to-day -day, uh, job. Um, I have a few resources here at the end. Uh, if you want to learn more about BPF, um, 
there is this IO advisor uh, organization on GitHub with a lot of projects. Uh, Brendan Gregg wrote uh, the flame graph libraries that I was using. You can go to his blog post, to his blog. He, he wrote most of the tools that you've seen today. Uh, he wrote a lot of other tools that help, that help you do performance analysis and observability in Linux. Um, a friend of mine and I are writing a book about this for really, if you're interested. It will hopefully be published in November. -ish. It really depends on how much I write in the, in the next two weeks. <laughs> uh, and that's all. Thanks for listening.